everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the Big Recon on Sports podcast. I am your host, I am the Big Recon, Mike Martinez. And, well, it's special because it's the first one from the new house in Brunswick, Georgia. That's right, this is the reboot. So Big Recon is going to take a little bit of a change now. It's going to be a once a month, mostly Mets related podcast, but I'm going to sprinkle in some of my other teams I root for. This will not be all encompassing. That's what we got the wise guys once a week for. Um, it is Saturday, February the 24th, and we will be coming to you live tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, to discuss many, many things outside of what I'm going to talk about now. So really what I'm going to talk about now is I want to get into what the 2023 Mets were. I want to talk about the offseason that had a lot of people scratching their heads, including me. And I want to talk about what I think 2024 is going to be. The episode for the month of March will be my full 2024 New York Mets preview, as we'll have the roster basically down to pretty close to the 40-man and definitely the 26-man that the Mets will go north with to open the season at the end of the month. So let's talk about 2023 and let's talk about a season that started with a lot of promise until March when Edwin Diaz tore his patella tendon and was sidelined for the entire season during the World Baseball Classic. Here's why that one killed me. Because immediately you knew the Mets were not going to be what they were projected to be, which was, again, one of the top teams in the National League. Coming off a 101-win season when they finished in a flat-footed tie with the Atlanta Braves and missed out on being the two-seed in the playoffs because they played 10 of the 19 games in Atlanta. That's why they ended up in the two-seed. They played 10 of 19 games in Atlanta. So coming off of that season, the Mets had a lot of things to look forward to. The loss of Jacob deGrom was a big hit in that offseason, but to replace Jacob deGrom with the American League Cy Young Award winner and Justin Verlander really did take some of the pain away. But the season seemed star-crossed after the Edwin Diaz injury. Verlander didn't pitch until really late April, early May. Max Scherzer was never what Max Scherzer was pre-injury starts in 2022. And really the Met rotation was carried by rookie Kodai Senga, who in any other year wins the Rookie of the Year award with 200 plus strikeouts, a sub-3 ERA, led the team in wins, but Corbin Carroll was insanity last year. So here we are, <clears throat> excuse me, going through the motions of a 75-win season when the Mets did something I never thought I th they would do during the Steve Cohen era, and that is they had a full-on fire sale. DeGrom, DeGrom, excuse me, Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer were both traded for high prospects from both the Texas Rangers and the Houston Astros, respectively. Mark Canna was sent away for a very good prospect. Ed, uh, Eduardo Escobar was traded for a decent prospect. Tommy Pham, the same. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the Mets went into full rebuild mode and let some of these younger players play a lot more, too. Francisco Alvarez became the everyday catcher. Brett Beatty was just about the everyday third baseman. And Ronnie Mauricio came out and was taking taking a lot of at-bats away from Jeff McNeil toward the end of the year and contributing well after the f roster expanded at the end of the season. So what did we look forward to for 2024? Well, we looked forward to a full year of Ronnie Mauricio playing either up the middle with Francisco Lindor or at third base, spelling Brett Beatty and maybe even moving Beatty to the outfield, leaving Mark Vientos as a DH or having Beatty and Vientos back-to-back -back each other as, DH, as a DH platoon. And then winter ball happened and... Mauricio was lost for the season to a torn ACL. Now, a lot of people would say, why is he playing winter ball? You've got to remember something. These guys played ball year-round their whole lives. That's what they do. They play baseball. It's not just... Base, professional sports and Major League Baseball are not just a profession, Anthony Rendon, you ass. Major League Baseball is a passion. Any professional athlete, you have to have a passion for that sport that transcends what you're going to do in your life for that period of time. Because if you think about it, the longest tenured Met in history is Ed Cranepool. It was 17 years. Ed Cranepool still alive today. 17 years to a life that long isn't a big amount of time. So what do you do? You play baseball. Mauricio got hurt playing baseball. Can't get too mad at him. The kid's going to be a dynamite piece of this organization moving forward. It did open a door for us to see Luis Angel Acuna, who is the younger brother of Ronald Acuna Jr., who plays four hours north of me here in Atlanta, to have a chance at being the everyday second baseman probably comes second half. So what did the Mets do? What else did the Mets do this offseason? They did a couple things I really liked. 
They brought in Harrison Bader to start out being the everyday center fielder. Doing that and moving Brandon Nimmo to left, who was playing a phenomenal center field, makes you keep Jeff McNeil at second base, where him and Francisco Lindor, in the first two years that Lindor was here, formed a very good bond and were playing very good defense up the middle. You move Nimmo to left, you move Bader to center, and of course right field to Starling Marte, who last year was injured most of the year. So you... Hopefully, Starling Marte can have a better season, and he says he can play 170 games. The biggest addition is Edwin Diaz. You get Edwin Diaz back, and now the back end of your bullpen is solidified. They did a couple of nice moves, adding Jake Dykeman from Tampa Bay. They added uh, Fujinami from Baltimore. Two hard-throwing, one lefty, one righty, to go with Brooks Raley, who was very good last year, and brought back Adam Ottavino on a one-year contract when he said he wanted to stay. What the Mets did in the rotation is what's going to pace them for the entire season, especially now with Kodai Singh is going to start the season on the, D, on the IL, excuse me, disabled list no more, injured list now, on the IL with a strain in the posterior capsule in his shoulder. What does that mean? Well, that means he basically has arm fatigue from going from Japan, pitching once a week, to pitching every fifth day in New York. Not unexpected with Japanese pitchers. It happened to all of them. And all of them, unfortunately, have had Tommy John. Shohei Otani being the most recent one. The additions of Luis Severino and Sean Manaya were phenomenal additions, in my opinion. Now, hear me out, Met fans, whoever listens to this or watches it. Here's the thing about him. Manaya and um, Severino as I get the cat out of the way. Sorry about the bouncing, but one of the cats was scratching himself on the table. Because I do wise guys from in there and I do big reeking from in here. Adding Severino and Manaya on one-year prove-it deals or prove-it deals like they have, I believe Severino's is two years, gives the Mets a quality of pitching arms at the major league level that gives them depth they did not have last year, which is what killed them. No depth after Verlander and Scherzer and Kodai Senga is what really killed the New York Mets last year. They retained David Peterson, who is going to be ready by midseason. Tyler McGill actually gets to start this afternoon in their uh, spring training opener. So the Mets, for the first time in a few years, have some depth in the starting rotation where they're not going to have to rely on their one top-line guy to move on and get things done. As far as offensively goes, Francisco Lindor is coming off only the fourth 30-30 season for a shortstop in Major League Baseball history. Yes, that's right. Four of them in the history of the game. Lindor did one last year with 30 30 homers, 30-plus stolen bases, and over 100 RBIs. Pete Alonso is going to anchor the center in the the middle of that lineup with his 40-plus homers and 125 to 135 RBIs. Jeff McNeil looking to rebound from a subpar 23 after his batting title in 22, I believe is going to be back at that level again with consistent playing time. And he played hurt a little bit last year too. But the big question mark is going to be the young kids, the Mark Vientos, the Brett Beatty, the Francisco Alvarez. Alvarez proved himself to be a good catcher last year when he was the preferred catcher of all the veteran pitchers that the Mets had on staff. Not Tomas Nito or Omar Narvaez, who they had in, brought in in camp to start in Narvaez, but Francisco Alvarez. And then dudes hitting bombs left, right, and center, hitting 25 home runs, setting a record for Mets rookie catchers. Beatty is going to go into this season, I believe, as the everyday third baseman, which is smart. If they platoon him, it will be with Mark Vientos, which again, not having Mauricio out there, takes a bat and a dynamic player out of a lineup that now isn't as long as it used to be. You don't know what you're going to get out of Marte. You're going to get speed, but is he going to be able to hit 250 out of Harrison Bader? Brandon Nimmo with 24 home runs last year out of the leadoff spot. You're probably going to have to move him down in the lineup. What are we going to get? Is McNeil going to get back to what he was? Can Lindor and Alonzo repeat their performances of 2023 in being the all-star caliber Lindor the Gold Glove caliber and Pete the Silver Slugger winner as was Lindor, well, Silver Slugger caliber uh, as Matt Olson of the Braves won that. How far is this team going to get? Well, it's really how far their pitching is going to take them. I don't know. 
I honestly don't know. They have two guys who are on prove-it deals in Minaya and Severino. You're not going to have your ace in Kodai Senga for the first, probably, I would say, couple weeks of the season. McGill is a good piece. Mike Vassell, who's in the minor leagues, could be a good piece. But for the first time in a long time, the New York Mets don't have an ace going into the season. Really, since... 2014. Because you weren't sure what Zach Wheeler was going to be. Jacob deGrom didn't come up until the middle of the year. They had parted ways with Johan Santana due to the injuries. Um, Ari Dickey, the Cy Young winner in 2012, was gone already. And Matt Harvey had Tommy John. He was out. In 2015, Harvey was the ace. Fought with deGrom and Mats and Syndergaard. 16, they had all those boys again. 17, 18, 19, 20. 21, 22, you had Max Scherzer added into the list. And in 23, you had Scherzer and Verlander at the top of the rotation. And Kodai Senga came along. So it's going to be rough for the New York Mets, I think, this year. But not so rough, they can't make a run. I will give my prediction in March when I do the full, full release of the season prediction. So let's talk about what didn't happen this offseason. And that is the extension of Pete Alonso. Let me be very, very clear. And by the way, Big Recon is now going to be not just for kids. This will have some language in it, and this is one of those times. And this franchise is stir crazy fucking stupid if they don't think Pete Alonso needs to be in a Met uniform for his entire career. As I said before, it is almost it is almost fate that in September of 2018, we said goodbye to David Wright, who was at spring training this week. And that was hurtful. Not angry hurtful, but heartache hurtful. David was supposed to be the cornerstone and was the cornerstone of the franchise for 15 to 20 years. And we were robbed of some of that because of injury, because he played hard. But it's almost like fate that on opening day of 2019, we said hello to Pete Alonso. And Pete became the face of this franchise. Lindor earns the most money. Scherzer and Verlander were the first ballot Hall of Famers that they brought in to try and win a World Series. Pete Alonso is the face of the New York Mets. He does almost everything right. And I say almost because there are only two perfect things in the world. God and Mary Poppins. And Pete's not Mary Poppins. It's almost like Steve Cohen, who came out this week and said, we love Pete and we want him to be here, wants him to test free agency so he can swoop in with a huge offer and show these Met fans that he's still going to spend money, even though he allowed a massive fire sale in 2022. This is what Pete not being here means to this franchise. It means that you will go into a 2025 season having locked up homegrown players like Brandon Nimmo, like Jeff McNeil, apparently like Francisco Alvarez, who they're looking to lock up now. But the guy who is the greatest home run hitter as a rookie in the history of Major League Baseball doesn't get a contract. The guy who has bled orange and blue for a lot longer than just Mets fans understand. The guy went to the University of Florida. He's been wearing orange and blue since he was 18 years old. This is our guy. David was our guy. He needs to be here. And David Stearns, if you ever listen to anybody's amateur stuff, listen to me. You will lose every bit of favor with this fan base if you do not re-sign Pete Alonzo. Now, are you looking to get him as a Scott Boris client to get into free agency and go, hey, listen, we got all this money coming off the books. We're built to win. We want to keep it going. Look at the core we've assembled around you that we're keeping. How about you stick it out? I think Pete would do that. I don't think you're getting a hometown discount anymore. I think you would have gotten it by re-signing him after last season. 
But that's the chance you take when you let a guy who's represented by the biggest... Scott Boris reminds me of Scrooge McDuck. He's got this big vault of money that he just dives into and swims around, spits out like that. And it's all his commission he's made on his gigantic contracts that most of them have never panned out. Why are we even tempting fate with this? Why? Sign the guy. Steve Cohen, open up your pocketbook. Nine years, 270. With the DH now in the National League, he can move. And he can hit. And that's all he's got to do is hit the baseball. So let's talk about real quick what other moves I think the Mets need to make between now and opening day. I do think they need to add a pitcher. And the scary thing is both Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell are still out there. Do I think they're going to be players for either one of those guys? If I had to guess, it's going to be Jordan Montgomery. Because here's my opinion on Blake Snell. I understand analytics have taken over Major League Baseball. I understand Jacob deGrom won a Cy Young with one game over 500 as his record, but he pitched a lot of innings. He struck out a lot of batters. He had a phenomenal ERA. Blake Snell averages less than six innings pitched a game and won a Cy Young for a team that was terrible. Jordan Montgomery has gone to the playoffs the last two years and proven it, culminating in a World Series ring with the Texas Rangers. So if I'm the Mets, I, I'm going after Jordan Montgomery. Signing a bat. I don't know. J.D. Martinez is still out there. He would be your DH. Then you would be basically roped into a full platoon role at third base for Mark Vientos and Brett Beatty. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's This is the one-off season where there isn't a move to be made that just jumps out at you. Yamamoto, they were in on. Of course, he went to the Dodgers. And I had a feeling wherever Otani landed, Yamamoto was going there as well. Um, of course, Otani lands with the Dodgers with the Bobby Bonilla contract on steroids. I'm going to say this right now. No one ever disrespect my franchise again and bring up Bobby Bonilla on Bobby Bonilla Day because I'll start sending out the tweets about how much the Dodgers are going to be paying between Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, and Shohei Otani come in the next several years. If I'm a GM, or if I'm David Stearns, I would take a shot on J.D. Martinez for a year. Throw him in the DH role. He can hit both right-handed and left-handed pitching. You don't have to platoon it. Platoon at third base. Let Brett Beatty play against all the righties. Let Mark Vientos play against all the lefties. Because next year, guys, if they don't show out this year and make... The Mets move Jeff McNeil to the outfield full time. He's gonna play. Ronnie Murray's gonna play third base. He's gonna play every day because he's a switch hitter. Beatty and Vientos are basically on one year deals right now, trying to prove it. And the other reason you need to prove it is, I really think Luis Angel Acuna is gonna be ready next year, both offensively and defensively. So it's going to be an interesting season for the Mets in 2024. This could be one of those transition years, much like 1983, 1999, uh, 2005. The difference is in 99, they made the playoffs. 83, I'm sorry, 84, um, 40 years ago, was the Dwight Gooden first year of Keith Hernandez, full, first full season of Daryl Strawberry season. And this team took off where they never finished lower than second from 84 through 1990. And the thing is, with the way the National League East is currently set up, they're going to finish second at best. Atlanta is too, too good. Now, injuries happen. Is Acuna going to steal 70 bags again? Is Olsen going to hit 50 bombs again? Are they going to get the same production out of uh, Orlando Arcia? Is Austin Riley going to stay consistent? Is Michael, um, oh, the center fielder, the, the one who won Rookie of the Year two years ago, is he going to stay consistent? All these things could change. I don't see them changing, but they all could. 
So really what the Mets need to do is they need to figure out a way to get in the dance because as proven in the last couple of years, as long as you get in the dance, you can get there. The last two National League champions were one of the final teams to get in each time. Arizona was the final team to get in. I'm pretty sure the Phillies were. No, San Diego was. The Phillies were the second to last team to get in. The Phillies went to the LCS last year in the World Series two years ago. Arizona got in, went to the World Series by beating the Phillies. There's a lot of talent on this Met team. They all seem to be pulling in the same direction. And under a rookie manager, that's what you need. And he very, very tellingly, the only change in the New York Mets coaching staff was the manager. Mendoza is the only addition. Eric Chavez is not... Well, Eric Chavez went back to being the hitting coach. Jeremy Hefner is still the pitching coach, who has done a phenomenal job with this staff for the past several years. I got a funny feeling about 2024. I'm not going to give my full prediction today. That is for the end of March. I just got a funny feeling about 2024. So as I wrap this episode up, it wasn't going to be a long one. I'm just getting back into doing single content, and i got to get ready for tonight because Jim and I got a big show for you tonight. We're going to get this on uh, part of it on TikTok. We're going to get a uh, question of the day for wise guys on there. That's tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, Steph and Bobby are away. They went to my in-law's house in Palm Coast, which is why we're going at 8 o'clock and not 9. Um, I don't have to put Bobby to sleep. I need a nap, though. So anyways, Big Recon can be found everywhere we used to be able to be found. Google. Now on YouTube Music. Amazon, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, the whole nine. Anchor is now Spotify. So when I upload this, hopefully the RSS feed still works right. I can get this out to you guys today. Last but not least on this Mets team. I was talking to John this morning, Sporting Sith, who does the shows with Jim and I and him and I are going to get into uh, College Football 25 when it comes out in July. But we were talking about the trade that was made three years ago for Francisco Lindor. And I have never seen a trade be win-win for two teams like this. Andres Jimenez has turned into exactly what I thought Andres Jimenez was going to be. And I'm kind of pissed that he wasn't a Met, that he had to be in that deal. Because he earned his big contract and he's earned his all-star spot. Lindor has been everything, outside of the what I call the Carlos Beltran year, has been phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. 30 home runs and 100 RBIs two years ago, 30 home runs, 30 stolen bases, 90, I think 98 RBIs last year. And he's played gold glove defense every single minute he's been here. But the fact remains this is Pete Alonso's team. This is the move the New York Mets need to make if they want any shot at competing, at having credibility, in my opinion, and at keeping the fan base happy. As garbage as the teams were at one point in time, we loved that Sandy Alderson made the Wilpons open the checkbook for David Wright. We loved it. He stayed home. He stayed for us. I think Pete will stay for us too. Thank you for listening. It's been way too long. The last Big Recon episode was previewing the 2021-2022 CFP. Or I'm sorry, 2022-2023 CFP. When my Buckeyes fell to the Georgia Bulldogs, which I see that G all over town now. That's what I get for moving to Southern Georgia. I will see you guys sometime in the month of March. In the meantime, at 1 o'clock, I'll hear the saxophone. About 1.30, we'll hear Keith Hernandez, Gary Cohen, and Ron Darling on the call, along with Daniel Murphy. It's Met Fan Heaven. Maybe one day I'll do a show from Port St. Lucie for you. Have a great rest of your weekend, everybody. Thanks again.